you, Bill Kennedy, uh, to the rescue. Um, Bill, come on out. Oh, what happened here? Oh. Just gonna do two creeps then, right? Whatever you got to do, man. I'll, um, I'll... I like how you creeped out, Bill, like a creep. <laughs> it's creeping back. No, come back, Bill. Creep back in. Creep back out. <laughs> Into a light. No, don't give him another round of applause. People are get a maximum of one round of applause each. Um, before we do that, Natalie, I wanted to ask you, I want to play that game, Two Truths and One Lie. Yes. So we can get to know you a little bit. Absolutely. And then Bill and I and the audience will try and figure out which is the lie. So what's your first one? Okay, so Matt told me, don't say my first truth is, my second truth is, my yeah. third yeah. lie is. So my first truth is, I spent a year living in Germany. You spent a year living in Germany. My second truth is, I spent a year living in Kenya. You spent a year living in Kenya. My third truth is, I spent a year living in China. I saw that giggle. I didn't say a lie, so I promised in I did China. that. So, oh, you spent a year living in Germany. Kenya or China, and one of those is a lie. Okay, so who thinks... No, all throws are truths. They're all true. Okay, who, no thinks, lies. who thinks the first one is a lie? Okay, quite a lot of support for that one. I was a bit su surprised that. Who thinks that Kenya was a lie? A bit less. And what about the third one, uh, uh, in China you lived? Who thinks uh, Natalie didn't live in China? Okay, um, this is not science, but I think, the, I think the audience chose the first one. So is the first one a lie? You didn't live in Germany for a year. Well, I, I lived in Germany for at least a year. Okay. Maybe it's... Bad phrasing? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Th this crowd is very pedantic. If you didn't live for exactly the rules, one year... I know. <laughs> I'm still looking for which cross street I stand at. Now there's only two. So where, where, what's the answer then? Where haven't I you? I never lived in China. So you lived in Kenya for a year? Yes. Wow, how was it? Amazing. It was completely the opposite. Did you know that this is peak winter there? Oh, yeah. What, this temperature? Well, this time of the year. Oh, well, are they in the southern hemisphere? Yeah. I don't know how they do it, folks, but things are different in different places, and it blows my <laughs> mind. Well, I think without any further ado, it's Bill Kennedy to the rescue. Woo! Thank you, Matt. Okay, we're going to have some fun. i got to keep you awake because you just ate a bunch of really good food and you're all ready to fall asleep. So I thought we'd have a little fun showing off some of the Go tooling. So here's a program that I wrote more than several years ago. At the time, I knew nothing about the I.O. package. And everybody talks about how great the I.O. package is, right? So I'm like, i got to learn this thing. I don't work on stuff that allows me to use it. So I decided to come up with a problem. I decided that I was going to search the entire Internet for the name Elvis. In any place Elvis's name was not spelled with a capital E, I was going to fix it, because he's the king, damn it. And we ain't going to allow that to happen on the internet. So in order to test my little program, I created this table. And you can see here on the left there, I've got Elvis kind of sprinkled in on the left, and what I expect Elvis to uh, be, right, the capital E there on the right. I wrote some functions to like, convert that into a single stream. And I set off to write a function, which I had never written before, anyone who ever tried to solve this problem before, just to do some programming to solve this problem. And this is kind of the approach that I took really, really quickly. What I went ahead is I used a new buffer, I put the, the stream in there, decided we needed to find five bytes, read the first uh, four bytes into the buffer, and then I would read one more byte out of the buffer, uh, one more byte out of the stream into the buffer. And once I had those five bytes, I do the equals. If it matches, OK, great, I found it. Let's fix it. If not, we just keep going. Now, that was the general idea. Maybe it took me like 20 minutes to do the, write this code. And it worked. I was pretty happy. So then I said, OK, this is interesting. I've gotten this to work. I, I sent a tweet out at the time, and I said, OK, how would other people solve this problem? And over the course of a couple of days, I got some code back. But this piece of code from Tyler Stillwater was amazing. 
Tyler said, look, bro, we're just reading the stream, so I'm going to use that reader. I'm also going to figure out the size is five, or we're looking for five bytes for Elvis. And then I'm going to start an index, and then I'm going to read one byte out of the stream at a time. I'm going to check that byte against where we are in the index. And if we match it like five times, boom, we know that it's all lowercase Elvis. We're going to fix it. If not, I'll unread the byte, and we'll continue to go. And I was like, wow, dude, you've done this before. This is pretty cool. So I asked Tyler, I said, Tyler, ha have you measured at all your algorithm? Have you, have you checked it out? He said, no. I said, good. Now that we've got two algorithms here solving the same problem, I'm going to write a benchmark, and I'll let you know what we find. So I went ahead and just wrote an underscore test file, added two benchmarks. Algorithm one is mine. Algorithm two is Tyler's. And I went off to see how these algorithms compared. So we've got those two benchmarks. Go test. We're going to say bench, run all the benchmarks. And let's take a look at the memory allocations as well. So if I run that, here it is, algorithm one. That's mine. There I'm running, right, 1,100 nanoseconds per op and 53 bytes of memory with two values allocated in the heap. And then I look at Tyler. He's running about four times faster than me. And he wrote a zero allocation algorithm. And I'm like, wow, I don't think I've ever seen that before. So I call Tyler. I go, dude, do you know you wrote a zero allocation algorithm? He goes, Bill, I have no idea. So I'm kind of like dancing a little bit. Like, this is exciting. Like, this doesn't happen every day. And I hang up the phone with Tyler, and then suddenly all my happiness turns to misery. I didn't write a zero allocation algorithm. I don't want to teach us this stuff every week. So now I ain't happy with Tyler. I'm a little like, He's like he's throwing the gauntlet down. He's challenging me. I'm four times faster than you, Bill, and I wrote a zero allocation algorithm. So and I'm like, oh, yeah? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see about that. I like my algorithm. I, I mean, I was going to name it like a pet. This is how much I love what I wrote. So I've decided that I want to try to beat Tyler's algorithm. But I can already kind of see a problem here. If I don't get rid of those two allocations, or maybe if I do get rid of those two allocations, that will be enough to be as fast as Tyler. The problem here is I've got to try to figure out where those allocations are coming from. Well, this is not a big problem thanks to all this Go tooling, because what we could do is run this benchmark again, ask for a memory profile, and write that to a file p.out. Now, unfortunately, I've got to watch Tyler beat me again, but I don't really care. I'm coming after him. Now, at this point, I have that p.out file. I also have this .test file. The test binary that the compiler built for this test sticks around. And if you're on one of the Intel processor chips, I'm not, I'm on an M1, then you can use that to actually get down to the assembly level of your profile, which I cannot show you today. But you can play with that later. Meanwhile, I got the p.out file. So now what I'm going to do is I want to kind of look at what's going on in algorithm one. So I go go tool pprof. Let's bring it up here. And I can just say, go to pprof p dot out. Let me see that. Boom. There I am in my command prompt. Now, most people will run the profiler in the browser tooling, which is really, really great. I'm, gonna, I'm old school. Look at me. I'm so old. I'm going to stay in the terminal here. And now what I'm going to do here is ask the tooling to list out information about my algorithm. So there it is. Line 83, there's a, an allocation. Line 89, there's an allocation. But let's just kind of try to understand this a little bit. There are two columns there. The first column is flat. The second column is cumulative. If you have a number in that flat column, what it's telling us is that the allocation that's being made, the, the allocation is happening because of code that's inside this function here. If it's cumulative, what it's telling me is that the allocation is happening down in the call path. So this is saying, OK, something down in the call path, there's an allocation on line 83. But something here in this function, it's happening there on 89. Now, I want to show you something that's a little odd, and I will eventually get to explain it to you. But let's bring up the web version of this list command, alg1. Do you see anything different from the console version? The web list is showing that allocation on line 83 is flat. 
is if it's actually happening inside of this function. The terminal view is showing it only as cumulative. Which one is right? Let's see if we can figure that out as we go. OK. Now, here's a problem with profiling. It can only tell you what is allocating. It cannot tell you why. So just because I see this, this isn't enough information. The question is, well, if this can't tell me why, what can? It's only one tool that can tell you why, and it's the compiler because it's the one running the escape analysis algorithm, and it's making the decision. So is there a way to get the compiler to tell us the decisions that it's making? Actually, there is. And luckily, because the compiler has to compile this test before it runs it, we can actually do the following. We can go back and run the benchmark, add GC flags, dash M equals 2. The dash M for the GC flags will give us the escape analysis report. There are four layers to that report. For if you're just looking at your code, 2 is all you need. If you have to dig deep into like go runtime stuff, then you might want to look at four. Way too much information. Two's enough. So let's get an escape analysis report along with this benchmark. So you just saw a bunch of text fly by. That's part of the escape analysis report. Unfortunately, I'm watching Tyler keep beating me. Oh, it's just making me angry. It's OK. We're going after him. And then what I'm going to do here is go back to our list, alg1. OK, I now have everything I need to figure out where these alloc uh, all allocations are coming from. And hopefully, I can get rid of them. Now, we're talking about stream.go. That's the name of the source code file. Stream.go line 83. So I'm going to do a search for stream.go colon 83. And I'm going to look at the top and see what comes up. Now, if you notice, the very first thing that comes up is it says, inlining call to new buffer. Oh, that's interesting. Inlining is one of the most important compiler optimizations that we have to help with that CPU performance. What it basically says is, we're not going to make this function call, set up a stack, do all that overhead. We're going to take the code out of the function and inline it in place of the function. Now, that's interesting to me. Why? Hold on a second. Let's do the following. I'm going to run this O command. You see this switch right here, no inlines? What is it set to? False. OK. Let's set it to true. And do the list command again. Oh, there it is. I now have a flat allocation. So what's happening? By default, when I'm working in the terminal, this view is not showing us uh, a picture based on that compiler optimization of inlining, which actually was taking place. The web view, by default, does. Well, since most of you work in the web view, this isn't a problem. But if you're going to start playing in the terminal view, this is something you should be aware of. And I'll show you in a second how you can set that switch on the command line. So we absolutely know that it's flat. We know that we've got something related to inlining here. OK, cool. Let's take a look at the code real quick. So that was on line 83. Where is that? Right over here. Line 83. OK. Now, if we were to just peek, peek at the definition of this function, we could see a couple of things here. We can see this is a factory function. It's constructing a value of type buffer, and it's sharing it up the call stack using those pointer semantics. Now, we don't have time to talk about all of the escape analysis stuff. But essentially, one really good rule is that I like to think about an ownership rule. I like to think this. Whatever function constructs a value is the owner of that value. Just put that in your head. That function does the construction. They're the owner. And now you ask one question. Does that value still need to exist when the function returns? When the owning function returns, does that value still need to exist? If it does, it's got to be on the heap, because the stack space for the owning function is about to 
go away on the return. It's not safe to put it there. This is the beauty of escape analysis. We don't have to worry about this. This is exactly what would happen. If this function gets called, it's an automatic allocation because the construction's happening in this function, being the owner, and then it's being shared up. So if the function gets called, it's an automatic al uh, allocation. However, thanks to the inlining operation, this function never gets called. Essentially, what happens is the compiler, in some form, does this. It takes the code out of the function, inlines it in here. Now, by doing that, who is now the owning function of the construction? It's not new buffer, it's algorithm one is now the owner. Now we see the difference in the, in, the, in the view. The first view, there is an absolute allocation. But when I have no inlining turned on, I'm sorry, turned off, we're assuming, that view is assuming that the function was called, and therefore the allocation's happening from inside. But once I say, no, 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 show me the inlining optimization, then it knows that the construction happened here, alg1 owns it, and so something else is causing input to end up on the heat. One of the cool things about Tyler, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Let me show you something here. So we know this method or this function call right is not being made. We know the construction's happening here. But I want to show you something else here. Ah, this is a good one. Maybe this is a better one. Study that. What does that say? Cannot inline main, function too complex, cost 728 exceeds budget 80. OK. I tried to look at the compiler code that scores all of this source code you write. I couldn't follow it, man. It's wild. But the compiler performs a, a, a score of every function. If that function scores 80 or less, then it's inlined. If not, it has to be called. Now you'd be saying, oh, Bill, how can I guarantee, without having to figure out all the points, how to make sure that things that I really want inlined are inlined? The general rule is, and this is really good for those factory functions that are constructing and sharing back up, those you really want to try to get in line, is if you make those types of functions, generally speaking, leaf functions, they don't make any other function calls underneath, you got a really, really good chance that they're going to score 80 or less. But if you're doing anything complex in there like loops and things like that, that's going to start costing you. But whatever, you know, you ran the code, it's all working, you might come back in here and just know that's a hot path, and then you can look at what your score is and start to try to reduce some of the complexity of that function. Okay, now we know that Tyler wrote a zero allocation algorithm, and we know that Tyler called new reader. So what do we know about this call to new reader? Tyler got the inlining optimization, and therefore, that didn't cause the allocation. And he's not doing anything else to cause an allocation while we are. OK, let's go back to the escape analysis report for a second. We understand the inlining at this point. Let's keep looking. OK, it shows up again. Now, we read through all of that, and suddenly I see this right here. Interface converted, line 113. It's telling me this is the reason it's chosen for that value input to allocate. Okay, 113. Let's go take a look at 113. There it is. What is it? It's the function call to IO read full. I don't see any real interface. There I see the input variable. Let's take a look at the, the definition. There it is right there. What is the first parameter? This is a polymorphic function, right? It accepts its concrete data based on what it can do. IO reader. What's happening is as soon as I pass input into this read function and it gets converted into that interface, automatic allocation. There's my allocation. How come Tyler doesn't have any allocations? Let's see. Tyler using input here. But if you notice, Tyler is not using the IO package. He's using the method set related to the concrete value. And that's using pointer semantics, and that being shared down, there's no allocation. So Tyler wrote a zero allocation algorithm because he's getting the inlining optimization on the new, and then he's just using the method set directly. So if we 
stop using the I.O. package and use the method set directly, we should be able to get rid of that allocation. Now, I know I started with the idea of wanting to learn the I.O. package, but at this point, I don't really care. This is me, me and Tyler. And since he used the, 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 you know, the method set, I'm going to use mine too. So here we go. We've got to do this actually in three places. The escape analysis report really just showed the last place here in the code. But we've got three places to do it. We've got that read full, that read full, that read full. So here's the cool part, right? Even though we're using our buffer, we have a read method, and it actually behaves the same. So I could technically do this and get rid of that call. And that call is the same down here. Great. Now, this call is a little different because we're just trying to read the next byte in. So what I'm going to do is still have that position goes there, error. And then on the input, I'm just going to do the read byte. And then obviously, I got to check the error. And then we're good. OK, and you go away. Interesting. I've just now removed all use of the I.O. package. Let's see what happens here. OK. So what we're going to do is we've got to run that benchmark again. We'll keep the escape analysis report going. And there it is. Look, we're down to one allocation worth five bytes. And now Tyler's only roughly twice as fast as me. <laughs> we're coming at you, man. <laughs> or you think you're fooling around with here, man. OK, but there's still one more allocation. So we've got to figure that out. So what we're going to do is bring up our profile again. But this time, what I can say is no inlines. And that's how you can, except if I spell it right. Uh, no, oh, I did spell it. Um, if you put no inlines here, that's the same as what I did with the O operation. OK. List algorithm one. And there it is now. Line 88. There it is. Buff. OK, let's not guess. The whole point here about Go tooling is you don't have to guess. If you're guessing, you're doing it wrong. So all we got to do is hit, OK, fine, stream, dot, go, colon, 88. There it is. Ah, what's the reason? Non-constant size. What does that mean? Here's another rule for the escape analysis, right? We talked about the ownership. If the compiler does not know the size of something at compile time, it has to be on the heap because all those stack frames are being calculated at compile time. They're fixed. So we have a problem here. The compiler doesn't know the size of the backing array for this slice at compile time, so those five bytes have to end up on the heap. Now, I can fix this as long as you don't tell Tyler what I did, because I only really care about Elvis. And Elvis is what? Only five bytes long. And so instead of using this variable, I can do this. Shh. Even if Tyler's watching this, this is an illusion, man. It's not, it's not happening. But now the compiler knows the size of the backing array, doesn't it? This should now get rid of all that allocation here. So here we go. We're going to run it again now. Let's clear that. Here we go. We're going to run it. In fact, I'm so confident. I'm so confident. Oh, yeah, I'm confident. And there we are. We now have a zero allocation algorithm, except what? Those five bytes didn't save us anything. Oh, man, he still tries as fast as me. All right, you know what? I don't really care. I'm, just going, I'm going after this. OK, so look, there's no more worrying about allocations, right? However, what I can do then is ask for a CPU profile and write that to p.out. I might as well start looking at uh, lines of code that maybe are not as efficient as they otherwise could be. So go tool pprof p.out on my CPU list, alg1, boom. OK. So I've got about a, uh, a second, 1.2 seconds worth of that cumulative time. Let's find the big, big numbers here. Not that big, not that big. That's kind of big. In fact, that's the biggest number. Let's look at that, bytes.equal. So ideally, if I want to make this run any faster, this is kind of where I really should start looking. Right? Looking at line 93 isn't going to help me. This is like the next big chunk. OK. But here's the reality of life. What should I have done a half an hour ago? 
I should have just used Tyler's algorithm, man, because it's so much better than mine. <laughs> this is a lot of work. And what we were talking about was what, 500 nanoseconds? Like, really? 500 nanoseconds and I'm losing my mind? That's crazy. As it is, we're only talking about a difference of what? 200 and something nanoseconds? Like, come on, is anybody going to feel that? I ain't going to feel that. But what's kind of cool with this exercise is this. If there's a function that you're kind of concerned about or pops up on a larger, say, profile, you can write a benchmark for that and then do everything that I just did to do these micro-optimizations on those algorithms. In a general sense, it's best to go after those memory allocations first for performance, not always. Sometimes you do have code, maybe they're in tight loops and it is CPU intensive. But as a general rule, if you get rid of those allocations, you get a big bang for your buck. Not the five bytes, obviously we saw that, um, but, but that other allocation was pretty good. And then you can kind of focus on the CPU, but don't go crazy trying to get every little nanosecond. That's the bigger, the bigger point here, right? Be wise with your time. But the Go tooling is amazing, isn't it? That's my talk. I hope you enjoyed all of that. And find me. If you